hair-raising ride on a flying motorcycle. A chance to look death straight in the eye. Oops, I'm sorry. And a wondrous flight through the colors of the rainbow. Experiences like these are made possible when we suspend disbelief and enter the magical world of motion pictures. Each of these cinematic illusions is accomplished through a visual effects technique called blue screen or green screen compositing. Coming up, we'll go behind the scenes on the comic book based action picture Judge Dredd, where effects artists are combining green screen with miniature cities and motion control photography to make a motorcycle fly. We'll also visit Ultimat, where technicians are creating tools that allow filmmakers to realize incredible visions. And we'll travel to the set of Rainbow, where some of the most unusual green screen rigs ever built are helping director Bob Hoskins send four child actors somewhere, not over, but inside the Rainbow. Next on Movie Magic. Continent Airport in Wichita, Kansas, actor-director Bob Hoskins is working on a new fantasy adventure film called Rainbow. The film also stars four young actors and comedian Dan Aykroyd. I hate kids. The story of Rainbow you know, is uh, a story of four kids who go on this magical, mystical ride in a rainbow. And as a result of some of their actions, color starts to disappear from the world. For audiences to believe in such a fantastical story, the visual effects must be convincing. And the trip through the rainbow is the most challenging effect sequence in the film. To create this illusion, visual effects supervisor Steve Robiner has decided to employ a technique known as digital compositing. This is a process in which an actor is first filmed against a green or blue screen. Later, the colored screen is digitally replaced or composited with a separate background element. The resulting illusion places the actor in the background's environment. Hoskins has decided to shoot Rainbow on Sony digital high-definition video. The technology allows him to see live, on-set color composites. This immediacy makes it possible to adjust lighting or actor's positions for more convincing shots. For Rainbow, the actors are filmed on a green screen soundstage in Montreal. To help create the appearance of weightlessness and flight, the effects team has designed and built a variety of unique mechanical rigs. These rigs are covered in green. Like the green backdrop, they will be replaced by background shots. From the beginning, we wanted a really uh, natural floating feeling, so the kids were free to move around. They didn't have a lot of uh, encumbrances, so we tried to make the rigs as comfortable as possible, at the same time making them do the moves that we needed them to do. One of the rigs used for close-up shots of the young actors as they travel through the rainbow was constructed from an automobile leaf spring and a bicycle seat. Of course, every kid's ridden a bike in his life, and so they were very uh, comfortable and felt free on the bicycle seat rigs. Part of the whole sequence that was really important to Bob was to get these kids playing and interacting with the rainbow and with the, the colors and light inside. For a group shot of the actors, Robiner employs a motor-driven spinning rig. The actors are secured into a molded fiberglass and steel body harness that is hidden under their clothing. Once they are in place, seven fans are turned on to produce a wind-blown look, and the cameras roll. Director Bob Hoskins is no stranger to acting within an invisible environment. In Who Framed Roger Rabbit, he performed many scenes in front of a blue screen. This past experience is now helping him direct the young cast of Rainbow. Look up, one, two, three. look down, and then look up, and then, wow, we're flying! 
One of the most elaborate mechanisms will be used for shots of the actors tumbling in the rainbow. Nicknamed the U2 rig, it was first used in a music video by the rock band of that name. It creates the illusion of tumbling through space by allowing the camera 360 degrees of motion around a stationary object. The camera is mounted on one end of a rotating arm and a green screen is attached to the other. As the camera moves around the actor, the green screen stays directly across from the camera, creating the appearance of weightlessness. After two weeks on the green stage, the crew moves to a Montreal high school swimming pool. A 14 by 16 foot green screen is submerged in the deep end of the pool. Its surface is illuminated by lights mounted both above and under the water. Before filming can begin, the young actors must be introduced to the world of scuba. Usually kids like you can, can last on the water at least a minute, okay? Breathing through an underwater air source called a regulator takes some getting used to. After a few tries, the young actors are ready and they are taken to the bottom of the pool by a certified diver. When the camera rolls, the diver takes the regulator from the actor and swims out of frame. The actor then performs while floating up in front of the green screen. That's great. Once they were trained, the kids, we just could not keep them out of the pool. They loved the water, which is one of the things I knew remembering what my childhood was like, that I always loved being in the water, and the kids would, would really have a good time and be able to express this freedom and the feeling of being inside a rainbow much better being underwater. After two days in the pool, the green screen photography is completed. The digital high-definition videotapes are then sent to Sony Studios in Los Angeles. Here, a team of 12 artists will composite the green screen shots with a computer-generated rainbow. We wanted to have a lot of particles of light and energy, and that would be flowing around the kids. Uh, Bob referred to it as the rainbow meat. The inside of the rainbow should be thick with color. In Sony's Edit Bay 1, Robiner and effects editor Patrick Byrne work on the composites. You can see it actually bleeding through right there. Now how about uh, coloring you a bit? Sure. We can bring a saturation up. Digital compositing is accomplished by creating what is known as an alpha or matte channel for the actor. The alpha channel creates a hole in the background for the actor's image. This ensures that the background will not show through. The actor is then inserted into the space made by the alpha channel, creating a seamless composite. For a shot known as the spin-out, multiple layers produce the final illusion. These include an alpha channel of the kids, a satellite photograph for texture, computer-generated body halos, and sparkle swirls. When all the elements are combined, the actors are transported from the green stage into the swirling colors of the rainbow. This shot in the rainbow sequence is also a layered composite. Robiner and Byrne start with an underwater green screen shot of the actor. Next, they create a computer camera twist on the underwater shot and its alpha channel. They also use layers of copper flakes in a glycerin water solution and a computer-generated gold sparkle pattern. By combining these colorful computer-generated effects together with some ingenious green screen rigs, Robiner and his crew have succeeded in bringing the magic and mystery of the rainbow to the big screen. Coming up, special effects compositing places Charlton Heston on the high seas and sends Rob Schneider on a crash course with Mega City One. From the beginning of movie making, directors have sought ways to combine shots of actors filmed on a stage with background scenes filmed elsewhere. The problem is that when two film elements are superimposed, there is a phantom effect wherein the background can be seen through the actor. To overcome this phenomenon, one must create a blocking silhouette for the actor's image. This is called a traveling mat. It ensures that the background won't bleed through. The first traveling mat technique was a tedious process called rotoscoping. Introduced by Max Fleischer in the early 1920s for animation work, traditional rotoscope mats were hand-drawn frame by frame by projecting the actor or foreground element onto a surface so that it could be traced. 
In the quest for seamless composites, several new techniques were developed during the 1940s and 50s, but the most widely used was the blue screen traveling mat process. Bill Taylor is known as a master of traveling mat photography. At Illusion Arts in Van Nuys, California, he creates some of the most convincing composites in the business. His work has been seen in such films as Tarzan, The Legend of Greystoke, and Beverly Hills Cop 3. The early blue screen system created some great composites, but it still left some things to be desired. It consists of four parts. A background element, which is the film of the setting into which the actor will be composited. A foreground element, which is the actor filmed in this case against a blue background. A holdout mat, which is an opaque image of the actor that we produce photographically on an optical printer. And a heavy cover mat, which is the reverse of the holdout mat, where the actor's image is clear and the remaining frame is opaque. All four parts of the traveling mat are assembled in an optical printer, a machine that photographs multiple projected strips of film onto a single strip of film. The result is a composite with no bleed through. The only problem with this system was that the cover mat also tended to hide fine details in the foreground element. In this scene from the 1956 epic, The Ten Commandments, a waving banner's motion causes it to disappear under the cover mat. That changed in 1959 with MGM's Ben-Hur and the groundbreaking work of Petro Vlahos, a scientist at the Association of Motion Picture and Television Producers Research Center. Douglas Hur, who was the chief of technology at MGM, came to me and said, we know that Paramount had a terrible time with their Ten Commandments, and we hope to avoid their problems. Can you do something to make this a better system? After six months of research, Vlahos came up with a process that eliminated the need for the problematic cover mat. He called it the color difference traveling mat system. Vlahos took his new technique to the MGM mat department head, Bob Hogue. So Bob Hogue says, well, I'm gonna make a test. So he ran all 17 shots that went into Ben-Hur and ran them through at once as a test. Got them out and when the management saw them, they said, put them in the picture just as they are. Don't touch a thing. Vlahos' new invention allowed Charlton Heston to fight a fierce sea battle from the safety of the studio backlot. His blue screen compositing system quickly became the industry standard, and in 1964, his groundbreaking efforts were recognized with an Academy Award. Despite his pioneering work on film, Petro Vlahos believed the best way to do blue screen traveling mats would be electronically. So in 1976, together with his son Paul, he formed a new company called Ultimat to pursue this new technology. Based in Chatsworth, California, Ultimat quickly became an industry leader in video compositing equipment for television, winning an Emmy Award in 1978. Then in 1992, with the development of the film scanner, it became possible to digitize film and input it into the computer. This enabled Ultimat to develop a software package for film compositing called Cinefusion, now used by many top visual effects houses. Cinefusion employs a series of complex mathematics to create an alpha channel. The alpha channel is a grayscale image. The black portions completely obscure the background, while the gray areas only partially obscure the background. This allows for such fine details as transparent bubbles to show through. One of Ultimat's biggest advantages is its ability to deal with poor quality blue screen photography. You can see that we've got a blue screen which is, well, it's the blue screen from hell. There's no getting away from it. You've got a burned out floor. You've got a shadow down here you don't want. You've got a seam where the wall joins the floor and different shades of blue that you've got out here. The compositor can select the best sample of the blue screen and then apply that sample across the whole frame, quickly eliminating the problem. The pioneering spirit that Petro Vlahos brought to Ben-Hur in 1959 is still going strong at Ultimat today. In 1995, he received another Academy Award, along with his son Paul, for further refinement of blue screen compositing. As the Vlahoses continue their research and development, they strive to provide future filmmakers with even better tools to conjure up movie magic. Coming up, 
a visit to Mega City One, where green screen puts Judge Dredd in the driver's seat. On the London set of Sylvester Stallone's comic book thriller, Judge Dredd, effects artists are pulling out all the stops as they transport audiences to a grim future world. Visual effects supervisor Joel Hynek, whose previous credits include the Predator films, is combining green screen technology with large-scale miniatures to make these space-age motorcycles called Lawmasters fly. The Lawmasters are important to the film for a lot of reasons. Uh, one being uh, that they're a vehicle by which we can involve the audience in the environment. The environment these flying motorcycles patrol is Mega City One, a gigantic future city where buildings rise to heights of 2,000 feet. Creation of this megalopolis takes place here in the Berkshire Mountains of Western Massachusetts at a visual effects house called Mass Illusion. Elaborate miniatures ranging in size from 132nd to 196th scale will provide the backgrounds to be composited with green screen photography. The models and miniatures and the size that they ended up being was what was the scale that we could make them at, that we could put the most detail on and still fit on the stage. A crew of 40 model makers has spent six months constructing the miniatures from wood, plastic and plexiglass. To create the interiors of the buildings, high-resolution color copy photographs are placed inside many of the city's more than 160,000 windows. I think the goal was to make Mega City real. And so part of the reason for the great detail on the models was so the audience could actually travel through the models, that you didn't feel like you were watching it, but you could actually go through it. And so the attention to detail, which included the imagery being placed behind the windows, just brought the buildings to life. The crew even designed and manufactured miniature stage lights to realistically illuminate the city. We use miniature lights on this show because, uh, like everything else, we wanted to miniaturize the light, the character of the light, and we wanted to miniaturize as well as the models. So um, our lighting fellow, Denny McHugh, designed a whole package of miniature lights that can be focused and positioned and with filter frames, just like you would have a, in a real studio, but very, very small. Once assembled, the miniature city stands 11 feet tall and 20 feet wide. Before filming, the crew smokes the set with a fogger. This non-toxic oil-based smoke helps to simulate a realistic urban haze. The miniatures are then filmed with a computerized motion control camera, capable of performing and precisely repeating a programmed camera move. After six months of photographing miniatures, Hynek goes to Shepherd and Studios outside London, England to film the green screen Lawmaster shots. Making it fly will require some carefully choreographed photography. For this, Hynek has enlisted the help of his pre-visualization department, which uses computer renderings to aid in the design of the green screen shots. The Lawmaster is set up on a six-axis motion control rig normally used in flight simulators to give it smooth in-flight movement. The camera is also motion controlled and repeats the same moves used to shoot the miniatures. This way, the two elements will match up when composited. To provide interactive lighting on the Lawmaster as it flies through the city, lighting technician Dennis Gardner operates a lighting board generally used for stadium events. Today, one of Judge Dredd's characters, known as a Judge Hunter, is suiting up to take to the skies. Hynek sets things in motion. During filming, Hynek uses a countdown to keep the crew and actor in sync. We use the countdown to cue everything, um, whether it be which direction Sly you know, should look during a shot or the interactive lighting. After 12 days on the Shepperton Green stage, Hynek and team return to Mass Illusion, where the green screen and miniature elements will be composited. Digital effects supervisor Serge Straczynski is charged with the task of compositing the different elements. Serge assembles the composites piece by piece, combining the live action green screen shot with the miniature backgrounds. For a 
shot of Rob Schneider's character, Fergie, on an out-of-control lawmaster, Hynek consults with Serge to make sure the final composite is perfect. And that's even better. Yeah, I'd take it back a bit. As Fergie spins off towards his inevitable demise, months of hard work disappear in a shot that takes audiences for the ride of their lives. Blue screen and green screen photography have helped to produce many of Hollywood's most memorable moments. By offering filmmakers a way to achieve shots that are too dangerous or simply impossible to accomplish conventionally, the future for this technology is brighter than ever. I think it's going to revolutionize the cinema industry. There's going to be uh, a lot less um, real sets built, a lot more CGI backgrounds. The state of the art of digital scanning, digital compositing, and green screen has gotten to the point where you can't tell if a shot is green screen anymore. Building on the work of pioneers like Petro Vlahos, Today's masters of blue screen and green screen photography continue to perfect one of Hollywood's oldest special effects. Their creative application of this technology helps filmmakers break through the barriers of space and time to a place where the laws of nature are governed by movie magic.